this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. Go ahead and present our next presenter. We have Dr. Liz Utaro. She is a current PGY2 emergency medicine resident at the University of Rochester Medical Center. And today she'll be presenting on the efficacy of combination haloperidol, lorazepam, and dihydramine versus the combination of haloperidol, lorazepam, and the treatment of acute agitation. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that introduction. As um, she said, today we're going to be talking a little bit about something I feel like uh, generally we all see quite a bit in our EDs is um, treatment of acute agitation, specifically looking at uh, two different combination therapies and how they uh, pair up against each other. So agitation in the ED, as we all know, can pose a safety risk to the patient, other patients, and staff in the ED. Therefore, prompt treatment is often needed. De-escalation should be the first-line therapy. However, this may not be a safe option, depending on the degree of agitation, or may not be effective enough to decrease agitation to where there is no uh, more uh, safety threat to people. Following de-escalation, I am sedating medications are our next step. There are a multitude of different IM sedating medications that can be given. However, for the purposes of this study, we're going to focus on two common combinations we may see. The B52 combination consisting of diphenhydramine, haloperidol, and lorazepam. And then the 52 combination, which is just haloperidol and lorazepam. Just uh, to kind of explain why we call it B52. Um, so Benadryl stands for the B. Five milligrams of haloperidol represents the five. And lastly, two milligrams of lorazepam represents the two. Even though these medication combinations have been used for a long time and are used quite frequently, we actually have very little evidence to support these uh, treatment modalities for acute agitation in the ED. Without going into too much detail here on the medications, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of how these medications work in acute agitation treatment. First up is diphenhydramine, which is an antihistamine, uh, which is typically dosed at 50 milligrams IM when we are using it for agitation. Some adverse effects that can be seen include anticholinergic effects, mainly seen as depression, which we will see sedation from, which could be a good thing or a bad thing in this situation, depending how much sedation there is. The theoretical purpose in adding diphenhydramine to agitation treatment is to help prevent extrapyramidal symptoms or EPS from whatever antipsychotic is used in the cocktail. Um, so in this case, it is hopeful to help prevent those EPS symptoms from haloperidol. And it also may provide additional sedation, which may be helpful for some patients and may be a harm for others. Haloperidol is the agent we typically think of targeting the acute agitation at its core. It is a first-generation antipsychotic that blocks D2 receptors in the CNS. For acute agitation, haloperidol is typically dosed at 5 milligrams IM. Potential adverse reactions that we think of include the EPS as well as QTC prolongation, which is more so an issue in um, some of our frail elderly patients. As mentioned previously, this agent is used to target the agitation. Lastly, we have lorazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. Uh, is enhancing the inhibitory effects of GABA, which is typically dosed at two milligrams IM for acute agitation. Adverse drug reactions we may see here is CNS depression, mainly sedation, which is also the theoretical purpose in um, adding this medication to the uh, medication cocktail to help provide that additional sedation and mostly because haloperidol is one of the least sedating antipsychotics we have. Um, so lorazepam is added to help with the sedation component. As mentioned previously, evidence behind adding diphenhydramine and lorazepam to haloperidol for the treatment of acute agitation in the ED is lacking. In 2017, a Cochrane review was conducted, which included four trials comparing haloperidol alone versus a few different combination, combinations with other agents to treat agitation. The results of this Cochrane review uh, showed the addition of lorazepam did not significantly improve agitation, but increased sedation. This was an interesting finding to me because when I think of increasing sedation in these patients, I inherently think that uh, their agitation decreases as uh, sedation increases, um, so just something I found interesting. Diphenhydramine is added to the cocktail of medications to theoretically help prevent uh, those EPS symptoms after haloperidol administration. 
So Vincent and Drotz in 2001 investigated if adding diphenhydramine to prochlorperazine would reduce EPS. The authors in this study found diphenhydramine reduced in incidence of akesthesia by 22%. But this was with prochlorperazine. So now we have to think about how often does EPS occur after administration of haloperidol instead of prochlorperazine. To answer this question, we have a study done by Klein and colleagues in 2018, which investigated the incidence of EPS after haloperidol administration for acute agitation. The authors found only 1% of patients developed dysonic reactions, leaving us with the question of whether or not the addition of diphenhydramine to reduce EPS is worth the potential additional side effects uh, we can see with diphenhydramine. So why did the authors complete this study? As uh, shown, we have limited evidence exists um, justifying the addition of diphenhydramine and lorazepam to haloperidol and agitation treatment. Anecdotally, the B52 combination works well or it wouldn't be used as frequently. So we have to keep in mind there are some downsides to adding more medications than actually needed. For example, multiple IM sticks in an already, already agitated patient may put the staff in more danger while attempting to administer three different medications. Also, adding more medications to the cocktail can lead to additional adverse reactions, such as increased sedation, potential for airway compromise, and hemodynamic instability. To briefly review the study design, this was a multi-center retrospective non-inferiority cohort study, which was completed from August 2017 to September 2020, which is pretty recently. The author's objective here was to compare the efficacy and safety of combination B52 versus combination 52 in treating acute agitation in the ED. Patients were included in the study if they were 18 years or older and had received either a B52 combination or a 52 combination medication cocktail. Another stipulation was all medications must have been given at the same time, which the authors defined as within 15 minutes of each other, which I think is pretty reasonable. Patients were excluded if there was a pre-existing movement disorder or if the patient was in active alcohol withdrawal. Personally, I would say this is pretty representative of some patients I've seen here um, in RED. And in general, I would say this population is pretty generalizable to most agitation patients. I did like that the authors did exclude patients in active alcohol withdrawal as the scenario would require different treatment. And I think it's important that we are able to distinguish between agitated patients as well as patients that are in alcohol withdrawal as they may have similar uh, presentation. As mentioned previously, the two interventions included B52, which was 50 milligrams IM diphenhydramine, 5 milligrams IM haloperidol, and 2 milligrams of IM lorazepam or patients had the 52 combination, which included just the five milligrams of haloperidol and two milligrams IM lorazepam. The primary outco outcome of this study was incidence of administration of additional agitation medications within a two hour period after administration of the initial regimen. Secondary outcomes included incidence of EPS, hypotension, bradycardia, hypoxia, and the use of physical restraints. I think these are appropriate outcomes to assess uh, safety and efficacy of these regimens. Looking at additional medications um, administers allows us to, to assess whether or not that initial regimen was effective in reducing agitation. The secondary outcomes really focus on the safety component of these regimens, which again, I think is important because the additive effects of these particular medications can cause some serious side effects, such as hypotension, hypoxia, airway, and airway compromise. And this ultimately may lead to a requirement of higher level of care for these patients. Briefly running through the statistical analysis, the authors calculated 400 patients were required to detect a 10% difference in need for additional uh, sedative use between the two groups. However, as I previously mentioned, this was stated as a non-inferiority study. Uh, when I was reading uh, the study, I didn't see that they mentioned a non-inferiority uh, margin um, in the study, so just something to keep in mind. The rest of the statistics were appropriately conducted with categorical vari variables being evaluated by chi-squared or Fisher exact test. Continuous variables were first evaluated with the Shapiro-Wilk test to assess if the data was normally distributed or non-normally distributed for the study. The data in the study was not normally distributed and was therefore appropriately analyzed using the Wilcox and Rank sum test. Total almost 8,500 patient charts were identified as eligible for inclusion. A subsequent 403 charts uh, were chosen using a random number generator and they were reviewed. Of the uh, 403 initial charts reviewed, 400 were included and three were excluded. 
exclusion reason, reasons for those three, uh, where two were in active alcohol withdrawal and one was due to medications not being given within 15 minutes of each other. Looking at the first part of the baseline characteristics, the population consisted of mostly white males around the age of 40. When comparing the demographics between groups, we can see they are pretty well matched, not really any huge differences between them. This population seems to match the type of patients who are receiving medications for agitation versus de-escalating techniques. Young males may present or may be perceived to be more outwardly threatening, prompting more medication treatment to mitigate these risks to themselves, other patients, and staff versus using a de-escalation technique. When looking at the second half of the baseline characteristics, we can see again, the groups are pretty well matched, um, except for more patients in the B52 group had more underlying psychi psychiatric illness as a suspected cause of agitation compared to the 52 group. This could be due to a multitude of reasons, such as if the patient has been seen before, they may have received uh, B52 previously, and that's what works for them. Um, they may have other antipsychotic medications on board, prompting the provider to consider adding diphenhydramine um, if EPS uh, may be a contributing factor or if thought to be exacerbated by agitation treatment. When looking at the results of the primary outcome, there was no statistical difference between need for repeat medications between the two groups. So this shows us both combinations are equally effective in treating acute agitation. I would have liked to see the timing of the additional medications within the two-hour time frame to see when repeat medications were given. My thought is if repeat medications were given within the first 15 to 30 minutes, was there enough time to allow the first combination to work? Or was there a potential for dose stacking at this point? Um, or were these repeat medications given, you know, an hour, hour and a half in, um, and really just the need for additional sedative agents? When looking at the secondary outcomes, we can see there were a few statistically significant differences between the two medication combinations. First, we see patients in the 52 group were more likely to receive anticholinergic medications within two days of 52 administration compared to the B52 group. This indicates to me that there may have been more incidence of EPS in the 52 group without that diphenhydramine. However, the authors did report the reason for anticholinergic use was not for EPS in most cases, mostly used for allergy symptoms, home medications, or used for insomnia. Next, patients in the B52 group had a longer length of stay in the ED compared to the uh, 52 group. This is important for many reasons. Two that stick out to me in particular, one, um, being in the ED can be a trigger for these patients, especially depending on where they are. I know in our ED, a lot of our um, agitated patients end up in the hallway and don't have actual rooms to themselves. Um, so this can increase those patients' agitation. And secondly, ED overcrowding with staffing shortages can often leave these patients with less attention um, and leaving them potentially with uncontrolled and or worsening agitation. You know, for example, if a nurse has a lot of patients, they may not be able to check in um, as frequently, leaving those patients without uh, medication longer than they should. The B52 group also had a higher um, incidence of physical restraint use compared to the 52 group, which is an interesting finding to me because with the additional sedation from diphenhydramine, I would think there would be less physical restraint use. Um, so just something to think about. In my opinion, two of the more clinically significant findings are that the B52 group had a higher incidence of both nasal cannula use and hypotension. These findings illustrate to me, the potential harm of using a B52 combination compared to the 52 combination due to those additive adverse effects of the drugs resulting in the use of supplemental oxygen um, and hypotension. So overall, the authors concluded that B52 and 52 medication combinations had relatively low need for repeat medications to treat acute agitation, indicating both combinations are likely effective in treating agitation in the ED. When looking at safety, the 52 combination resulted in a shorter length of stay in the ED, fewer incidents of hypotension and oxygen to saturation, as well as increased incidence of physical restraint use, leading us to believe that the 52 combination may be slightly safer than the B52 combination. So what can we ultimately take away from this study um, and how is this going to change our practice? So there were a few limitations to the study, as I kind of talked about throughout, but one of the main ones, this was a retrospective review um, relying on chart documentation, which can always produce bias. In addition, chart documentation accuracy um, of, you know, 
administration of these medications. Often, I know at least at in our ED, these medications may be overridden as verbal orders and may be documented on later. So just thinking about whether or not that documentation is actually accurate for our patients, especially with the timing, since we do have um, those timeframes of all medications within 15 minutes and then that two hour timeframe after. In addition, um, there was no mention of pre-hospital medication administration. Um, so this was not available to be uh, reviewed, which may skew our results if patients had uh, received prior agitation medications from EMS and what those medications were, as well as thinking about some home medications these patients may be on. My personal philosophy is fewer medications, the better, as long as it's safe and effective to do so. However, I also like to make sure I'm evaluating the patient as a whole, especially if they've had medications previously for agitation and um, working out what has worked for them in the past. Um, I know in our ED, we may have some patients that we've seen previously, and instead of experimenting with another agent, we will usually just give them what has helped their agitation in the past. With some of the patients, they know what helps, with, helps them, um, so we'll generally just go for that. In addition, um, using fewer medications, we can help reduce the adverse effects, such as excessive sedation, hypotension, and desaturations, which we can see with multiple sedative agents, as this study had uh, showed us that the B52 did have more um, desaturations and hypotension. Um, so something I always keep in mind. So overall, for me, the study isn't inherently going to make me choose a B52 or 52 um, cocktail all the time. In general, I'm going to um, evaluate the patients as a whole. So for example, I would avoid using diphenhydramine in some of our elderly patients who are at risk of over sedation and anticholinergic effects. Um, however, maybe for the younger patient who is on a few different antipsychotics at baseline, I may choose a B52 to kind of help to prevent that uh, EPS that the patient may have if they're on other antipsychotics at baseline. And then I think more prospective studies are needed to add to the data comparing these two regimens to really see which one may be better. However, I do think that these regimens in general are a little bit outdated and with other medications more readily available, um, such as ketamine, um, our second generation antipsychotic, so olanzapine, um, zapracidone, things like that, um, other benzodiazepines. Those are generally my preferred agents for acutely agitated patients in the ED. But I think that this kind of gives me a little bit of peace of mind that um, at least the 52 cocktail and generally the B52 cocktail are um, effective in treating agitation and um, generally safe overall. And then with that, I can take any questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.